Folks, Chris Voss here from the thechrisvossshow.com, thechrisvossshow.com. Hey, we're coming here with another great podcast. We certainly appreciate you tuning in. Thanks for being here. Be sure you know the drill. Go to our groups on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, everywhere across social media. Uh, go to our big group on LinkedIn as well. I see our LinkedIn newsletter. And also go to goodreads.com, for chess, Chris Voss. See everything we're reading and reviewing over there. And also youtube.com, for chess, Chris Voss. You can see uh, all the great videos we have on there. It's a free for a limited time and remember the chris voss show family loves you but unlike other families we don't judge you which makes us the best kind of family so make sure you subscribe to the show and share it out anyway guys we have an amazing author on the show i've been listening to his book it is a, a wonderful book uh the book is called lincoln and the fight for peace february 15th 2022 it just came out by john avalon he's joining us today to talk about his amazing book he is an author columnist and commentary uh commentator i should say and a senior political analyst and fill an anchor at cnn he appears on the new day every morning show uh, from 2013 to 2018, he was the editor-in-chief and managing director of the Daily Beast, during which time the site's traffic doubled uh, to over 1 million readers a day, while winning 17 journalist awards. I love it over there, Molly and, and everybody. Uh, he is the author of the books Lincoln and the Fight for Peace, Independent Nation, Wingnuts, and Washington's Farewell, as well as the co-editor of the acclaimed Deadline artist journalism anthologies welcome to the show john how are you thank you i'm doing fine man how are you doing awesome sauce awesome sauce it's honored <laughs> to have you on the show give us your plugs so people can find you on the interwebs well i mean you know not too hard to find uh at john avalon the uh, twitter handle and uh instagram and and all over cnn but by all means number one thing books fresh out of the gate go and buy it there you go. Beautiful book so far. What Thank motivated you. you want to write this book and take it up? You know, uh, my last book was Washington's Farewell, about George Washington's farewell address. And, and it was where he Washington warns about the forces that he feared could destroy our democratic republic, chief among which were hyperpartisanship. And then there's debt and foreign wars and foreign influence in our elections. But if you fast forward 80 years, Lincoln's dealing uh, with the ultimate crisis of democracy, our civil war. And um, I was not only interested in the lessons of Lincoln's leadership, how he was could be a uniter in a divided time, but most importantly, his vision for national reconciliation, reunification, his plan for winning the peace after winning a war, which is, is something that you know bedevils us to this day all the time. Uh, and and you know, Lincoln is someone who doesn't disappoint you after you spend even four years studying him. Uh, particularly mm -hmm. during the Trump presidency when I was writing this, Lincoln's honesty and his humor and his humility and his empathy, uh, I think really still stand out um, yeah. in a profound way for us today. You really paint a character of him uh, in his personality. I mean, he's he seems a really empathetic man, a man of really deep thought. And tell us more about that and what he was like. You know, <laughs> Lincoln was someone who combined opposites all his life. And you know, he's born in the South. He moves north and west as a young man. He's born in a log cabin. He dies a resident of the White House. He is someone who alternates between um, sunniness and sadness. Um, you know, his favorite plays are all comedies or tragedies. And I think that reflects his interior life. Um, someone who worked very hard to discipline his emotions and discipline himself, uh, turned himself into a the greatest writer we've had as a president um, via being a lawyer with no formal education. Um, and, and I think, you know, we, we see him so often as this sort of, you know, almost graven image. He's very stern and stentorian and distant. In, in fact, in life, he was he was criticized for joking all the time. He spoke in parables, <laughs> uh, which is something that he learned from, you know, not only, you know, Jesus, but but, you know, Aesop's fables and and Shakespeare's, you know, his favorite his favorite reading. And um, and, and so I think there's something, you know, what I try to do is take them off the pedestal to make their wisdom uh, more accessible. And, and you can recognize, I think they're even more inspiring when you see them, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly. There's very little ugly with Lincoln. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a kind man. And that to me is, is the most inspiring thing about him. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but he's just a profound leader. Yeah. And you talk in the book about how 
you know, he, he had a very broad vision and, you know, I've studied leaders and wrote about leadership in my books. Um, he, he had this vision for not only winning the war and, and getting the emancipation done, but also the reunification of the country and the future of it. If you want to talk a little bit about that, like you did in the book. Well, th that, that's the, I mean, that's the, the, the heart of the book. One of the things Lincoln mm -hmm. does in all his greatest speeches um, is he combines or he connects the past with the present and the future, which mm -hmm. I think is something that, that all great speeches and, and writing do. There's, the, there's a magical quality. Um, and in that, he's sort of a transcendent figure. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so it makes sense that in, he's faced with the greatest challenge, he calls the greatest challenge that could possibly be presented to practical state, statesmanship. Um, how do you, not only how you defend democracy, you know, the, the danger of going from the ballot to the bullet, which is uh, what the Civil War represented, among other things, not only expanding liberty, you know, four million slaves trying to reconcile the nation by removing the root cause of the war, the cause of his time, but also this question of how you stop the next war from reigniting on the ashes of the past. And there's never been a civil war in this scale before. I think that's one of the things we, it's hard for us to remember. I mean, 750,000 Americans died, but this this plays out over four years. Europe sees this as the death of democracy. They can't wait to come in and reconquer. Um, and Lincoln has no precedent to look to. You know, there's no book he can pull off a shelf and say, what, what, did, what did a leader that I admired do in a similar time. That makes his accomplishment, his invention of reconciling leadership, I think all the more impressive. And basically his insight is that if you don't win the peace, you don't really win the war. In a civil war especially, you can't simply you know, pound your opponents into submission and salt their fields. You need to find a way to get people to live together again and reason together again, even if you know it'll take time steering the nation toward a horizon of reconciliation. And so he did it with policies. Um, which is, is something I'm, I always love to discuss. I mean, securing military gains, economic expansion, cultural integration over time, but also through the power of not only his words, but his actions. Mm -hmm. And it's his actions that I think ended up being as inspiring as even that, that amazing final paragraph of, of uh, his second inaugural. Yeah. Do you, do you feel that he's really somewhat an example for the times we live in where we're so divided right now, we're separated and there's, and there's so much animosity. I was watching the CPAC, uh, I think it was Missouri's uh, Eric Schmidt. I think he used uh, a, a language of violence about several hundred times in his speech. You know, there, there seems to be those almost encouragement, you know, so you saw January 6th where the Confederate flag was, it was in the, was yeah. in the Congress and, you know, that's when I fell into shock and awe where I was just like, holy crap, we have not resolved the Civil War. Like, you know, David Blight, who's a, a great uh, historian of, of Civil War and abolition, wrote a Pulitzer Prize winning book about um, about Frederick Douglass most recently, he said that, you know, as, as long as we have a politics of race in this country, we'll have a politics of the Civil War. Um, and of course, Race is, is America's original sin, and so it's very difficult to distangle race and politics. And so the politics of the Civil War endures. There have been times we, we've beaten it back, and I, I want to say that we've made, you know, it's only taken over 150 years, but we've made enormous progress. I mean, I, I grew up partially in South Carolina in Charleston, and when we moved down there in the late 80s, early 90s, um, you could see that the hangover, um, so to speak. I mean, there were still you know, signs that, you know, little plaques that read the war of Northern aggression, things like that. Um, uh, but we've come a long way. And, and I think it's important for us to understand that our nation, you know, very, very often we do it's reflexively divide our politics, not just black and white, but North and South, red state, blue state. And things aren't that simple up close. Um, I think in a hopeful way, you know, I was doing some research the other day and, and in, in, in every major Southern city, except one, uh, that I could find, Oklahoma City, uh, that voted for either Hillary Clinton or Joe Biden and Barack Obama. Um, and, and, and that just goes to show that in some ways the deeper divides in our politics are urban versus rural. And they always have been. That goes back to the Constitutional Convention mm -hmm. um, and the first Congress. So, so it, I think that's the, the hopeful thing I keep trying to say is we're not as divided as we feel we are. But when you see it, when you confront the fact of an insurrection, you confront the fact of the endurance of the big lie, which I think is, can be understood as just a new form of lost cause mythology. Hmm. Um, you can't underestimate the threat we face. There's a quote from, 
from uh, General Grant, Ulysses S. Grant, I found that I had to check three times to make sure it wasn't apocryphal. And he said it 10 years after Appomattox, 1875. So he's president now. He's in Des Moines, Iowa. And he says, if we're to have another civil war, the dividing line won't be Mason and Dixon's, North and South. He says it'll be between patriotism and intelligence on the one hand and uh, let's see, uh, superstition, ambition, and ignorance on the other. Wow. And there are times I'm almost reluctant to repeat that because it, it, it carries uh, an assumption of moral superiority that is very unlincoln like. Yeah. Now, Lincoln has moral humility. He combines moral courage with moderation. And, and part of that is never mistaking moral courage for moral superiority. You have to mm -hmm. have a the spirit of moral humility. If, if you're really going to, to, to lead in a reconciling direction. But I think the fact that, that Grant predicted that um, and the fact that a lot of the iconography of the South still exists, if you look at the rise of the Confederacy, as I write in the book, I mean, to some extent, they can be understood, the Southern planter class, as elites posing as populists, trying to desperately resist demographic change. Mm -hmm. and, and so you see this resistance to a multiracial democracy and, and a majoritarian democracy has been a recurring theme throughout our politics i think we had tom hartman on the show the radio host and he talked about it was basically an oligarchy of of the southern uh, uh the southern you know guys having all the money wanting to just keep their power i think that's one way to under, understand things i mean mm -hmm. uh, you know there's there is an economic element to slavery which sometimes gets undone but one of the things that lincoln and, and the republicans who are the moderate progressive party of their time they're the big tent party you know abolitionists to people who want to stop slavery's expansion um you know one of their points is they're actually fighting for free labor mm -hmm. you know the slavery system is incredibly unfair to poor whites in addition to obviously the enslaved uh four millions of slave persons um and, 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 and people became captive to that economy uh, mm -hmm. in, in ways that are, are, are clearly uh, unforgivable. And, and one of the things that Lincoln tried to do, I mean, one of his plans for kind of moving the nation forward um, was to expand economic opportunity westward to sort of take the pressure off the north-south divide, have everybody feel a sense of investment in a shared economic future. Um, and, 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 you know, and he was very pro-immigrant, by the way. I mean, he, he dramatically increased the number of immigrants to America. Um, and so he had a kind of an optimistic vision of America's future. We think of him as being solely preoccupied with the past and the president, but he was a person who was fascinated by the future. I think that's one of the secrets of leadership, that the presidential leadership in particular, that sometimes can be overlooked. There has to be a deep belief in the possibilities of the future. And one of the things about reconciling leadership, particularly in wartime, is it requires the discipline to imagine a shared future that's not predetermined by the pain of the past and the present. And so whenever you have a politics that's preoccupied with resentment and revenge, that's not doing that. Yeah, it's not building and, and putting a vision forward. Uh, the, the characters you put forth made me really think about leadership, being a leader, being a CEO of companies uh, mm -hmm. and everything else. The way he talked about people behind the scenes, you know, it was very different than Nixon, say, for example, of how Nixon talked about his enemies. He, he still talked good about people. And it was very interesting in that way. To, to really hear of the character of the man and what a difference he was. And as you mentioned, his forward looking, you know, he thought by freeing all the slaves that that would lead to a great economic boom. He did. Um, I mean, you know, he, he had faith in human nature. He, he you know, there's a, a great book by Harold Holzer about um, that he co-authors about his, his the right to rise and Lincoln's economic vision. And, and that's something that, that, you know, doesn't get focused on as much, but part of the Republican free soil, free labor philosophy is this, um, you know, belief in small businesses and, and the, the importance, I mean, government's role is to do for people what they cannot, or communities, what they cannot do so well for themselves. So one of the reasons is as a Whig and as a Republican, he's, he's big on inf investing in infrastructure. Why? Because that can connect communities and businesses and help them succeed, help them do the things they can't do for themselves. Um, and that businesses and, and small and, and individuals and, and these yeoman farmers are, are actually kind of the backbone of the country. Mm -hmm. um, the goal is self-sufficiency. When he establishes the Freedmen's Bureau, which is this remarkably forward-looking organization that Andrew Johnson dismantles, it's, it's specifically, it's, it's a government organization, but it's designed to create a bridge from slavery to self-sufficiency. Mm -hmm. um, that's its purpose. Um, and, um, and I think one of the great tragedies of, of Reconstruction and why we lost the peace, in effect, 
um, uh, was that we, we the, the Freedmen's Bureau was not allowed to proceed. And so you, you didn't have the creation uh, of, of a post-slavery class of you know, African-American farmers who could be independent. Instead, you had the black codes and the sharecropping system that was imposed upon them almost immediately with uh, as the planter class rose back to power and Andrew Johnson basically acquiesced. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's perfectly the wrong man at the wrong time. I call him the anti-Lincoln in mm. my book. Mm. So uh, what's a favorite story of yours that's out of the book? You know, um, thank you for asking that. Uh, I'd say writ large, the way I begin the book, Lincoln walking into Richmond mm -hmm. um, is to me one of the most cinematic things in American history. Um, and it gets short shrift even in big Lincoln bios. I mean, it's this remarkably dramatic moment where you know, Lincoln, uh, the, the, the capital of the Confederacy has fallen only two days before. It's not yet fully secured. It's still on fire. Lincoln insists on going. It's his boy's 12th birthday, and he brings him and holds his hand and walks uphill. He hasn't found, um, you know, people where he can actually, you know, He's not being guarded by a, a, a military you know, guard. He's not striding in like a conquering hero. And it fits his lack of triumphalism. There's something incredibly, essentially modest mm -hmm. um, and, and, and hopeful where he speaks eye to eye. The, the other moment I love is, you know, where he shows his magnanimity. I mean, everybody knows those lines from the second inaugural with malice toward none, with charity mm -hmm. for all. Um, and, and I think that really speaks to the essence of, of Lincoln's personality and his heart. Um, but, uh, there's a scene where he tours before he leaves the, the city point, which is a, um, a military hospital in uh, city point, Virginia. Uh, it's, it's a, it's the, the, the depot field hospital. It's massive. And he goes and he shakes every wounded union soldier's hand, asks them their name, tells, has them, tell them their story, makes a connection. And then as he's about to leave, he's getting toured around by a bunch of doctors and he sees a, a there's a tent in the back. Uh, and he says, what's over there? And they say, oh, Mr. President, you don't need to worry about going there. Those are just wounded rebels. And he says very firmly, that's exactly where I do want to go. Wow. And he goes and he shakes the hand of all these wounded Confederate soldiers and officers who can't believe that Abraham Lincoln is standing above them. And he asks them about themselves and he asks if they'll shake his hand. And, and many of them, it, 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 they break down in tears later because they realize they've been fighting for a lie. You know, wow. they've been convinced that Abraham Lincoln is this sort of butcher of men, a tyrant, King, King Africanus the first. And in fact, they see he's a, a kind man yeah. who, who wants to heal the wounds uh, that have afflicted the nation. And it's just a profound example of, of how he's in the last six weeks of his life. He, he provides a portrait of a peacemaker in a really powerful way. And most of the book is kind of built around that time, right? The, yes. The last part. So, so I, I, I focus primarily on the si last six weeks of his life between the second inaugural and his assassination, the last big speech he gives, which is two nights before um, on, at the White House grounds. And everyone's expecting this big triumphal, you know, Lee's surrendered and, and Appomattox is this remarkable moment where Grant's generous terms to Lee are basically, you know, Lincoln is dictated to him. Um, but Lincoln gives actually a very almost legalistic speech about the principles he hopes will guide reconstruction. And actually they're very, they're very federalist. He expects it'll be a little different in every state. Um, but Lincoln's big thing is you, you don't compromise on big goals, but on all details, be enormously flexible. Mm -hmm. and that's yeah. All. It was amazing how he thought th through things and you, you painted the picture per perfectly in the book of when he goes to R Richmond and, and sees it. I mean, it's just, it played like a film for me the way it was read. And, and I think it was his, wasn't his son's dad's birthday. Or yeah, so it was Tad's yeah. yeah, I read the book. <laughs> oh, the, uh, it was beautifully played, and so there's. You mentioned early, I think, in the introduction or other places that there's there's a ton of books that were written. I forget the amount of of books on Abraham Lincoln. How is this very different set apart? Do you feel? Well, you know, this is a question I, I got. You know, not least from my wife, who who said, you know, why the hell was you know. <laughs> So as I was researching this, and obviously, you know, you got to love Lincoln if you love America, if you love mm -hmm. American history. Um, the texture of the man, his character. And, and one of the things that's very clear if you study history is that character is the single most important quality in a president. Nothing else comes close. Mm -hmm. But there have been 16,000 books published by the guy, about the guy. So yeah. the question is like, you know, why you other than your desire to spend four years with him? Um, and, and so... I became really interested in this question of Lincoln's vision of winning the peace. 
Mm -hmm. Lincoln the Peacemaker. And so I called a bunch of, uh, you know, Civil War Lincoln scholars, uh, called the uh, head of the Lincoln book, Abraham Lincoln Bookshops in, in Chicago, which is a great place. If any of your listeners are in Chicago, you should go visit, buy, buy stuff there. Um, and I said, you know, here's my idea. Has this been done? Am I stretching? You know, you know, I, I don't want to do anything someone else has done or if I'm if I'm looking for a theme. And and I'm standing actually with Daniel Weinberg in this Abraham Lincoln bookshop. And I ask him and I'm literally in it's three, four five rooms of books, just basically about Abraham Lincoln, oh, basically Abraham Lincoln and a little bit on the Civil War. It's like, you know, and he looks around and he's this, you know, this grand old guy who's, you know, he's not old, he's, but he spent a lifetime at this bookshop and he looks around and he says, you know, I'll be darned. I don't think anyone's done Lincoln the Peacemaker yet. Wow. <laughs> and the reason, by the way, there's a very good reason. He gets assassinated five days after Appomattox. He, he doesn't get a chance to implement his vision. And um, but my point is, is that if you if you track all his words and statements from the second inaugural through his final speech, um, his comments is, is, you know, the famous pig, uh, photo, uh, portrait, the peacemakers, which hangs in the White House, uh, where he's talking to Sherman and Grant and Admiral Porter. He has a very clear vision. It's mm -hmm. it, he's going to be flexible based on facts on the ground, but he has a very clear vision and intention. And it sets him up for conflict with radical Republicans and certainly, you know, the planter class and the Demo you know, the, the conservative populist Democrat at the time who want, you know, a, a restoration. Um, and and it, he's a he's a reconciler in a time of radicals and reactionaries. But um, that to me was incredibly compelling. Yeah, it was interesting how you wrote in the book how he 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 wrote he I guess he created what is it the Lieber Code? Do I have that mm -hmm. pronounced right? And and yeah. still you today and and some of the different ways that he really humanly looked at you know trying to reconcile things. If you want to touch on that at all, big, big big time. And the Lieber Code. I mean, there there are great books about this. And, and I but I, I I you know what what I tried to do in in my books and my writing is, you know, I'm going to hit on a big topic and I'm going to, I'm going to give you detail, but you know, if you want to go do a whole book on it, knock yourself out, you know, I'm going to try to distill it to its essence and not give it short shrift, but you know, uh, allow folks to, to get the essence of it. Lieber code is basically the first rules of war. And, and he does this with a Prussian um, uh, professor, uh, historian named Francis Lieber, who has a sons fighting one for the North, one for the South. Wow. And the idea is that, you know, you need to apply some rules to war, um, which doesn't mean that, you know, make it a little less barbarous, create a little bit of structure and context and, 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 and restraint, um, which is not to say, you know, Lincoln and Lieber believed in some ways that, that short words, wars were merciful wars. You know, you shouldn't fight with one hand tied behind your back, but that doesn't mean you should go assassinating people and poisoning people and, and, and killing civilians or soldiers who surrender on the battlefield. And um, that itself, I think, speaks enormously to his uh, magnanimous vision. I mean, Lincoln's mm -hmm. prescription is unconditional surrender followed by a magnanimous peace. And um, the fact that he spends time at the, the, the height of the war um, developing these rules of war, which go on to influence the Geneva uh, Conventions and are used at Nuremberg. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that was astounding to me. I'm like, wow, they're still used today. Yeah. And, and it really spoke to how he was... He was seeing that in the end we, we wanted to reconcile and come together. Um, there's some other aspects you talk about the book and the future of stuff. Uh, Woodrow Wilson, you talk about Germany and stuff. Do you think that if if he had survived and not been assassinated, do you think the Jim Crow thing would have risen, or do you think we might have live in a different history? I, I try to avoid what ifs because there's no way you're not getting over your skis, you know. I mean, and. and um, there's some things we we cannot know. What I think we can know is that Andrew Johnson took us off the Lincoln path with disastrous results. Yeah. Grant brought us back on the Lincoln path briefly and was able to work the Republicans to, example, pass the 1871 Enforcement Act, which beat back the first incarnation of the KKK in a time of enormous violence against free blacks and uh, voter suppression, intimidation, election subversion. And, and that period is so resonant because it reminds us that we can't take any gains for granted. We can't take mm -hmm. democracy for granted. We can't take our gains for granted. They've been hard won and they need to be, be defended. Um, I think, you know, when you look at Lincoln's magnanimous vision of peace, uh, you know, he's very clear. He, he wants amnesty for rank and file Confederates who we feel have been misled, but he doesn't want to let the Confederate leadership off the hook. At the same time, he doesn't want to make them martyrs 
either. Mm. You know, he, he, he doesn't want to hang them, even though that's the traditional punishment for treason. Yeah. Um, he just wants to make sure they don't get to claw their power back yeah. so fast. Um, and, and unfortunately, that's in effect what happens. I do think, despite the fact that Lincoln has a magnanimous vision um, and he wants to, you know, he's willing to give amnesty for Confederate rank and file, but he, he also wants to make sure that we are moving uh, free blacks towards the right to vote, what ultimately becomes the 15th Amendment passed by, by Grant and the Republicans at the time. Mm -hmm. um, I think that he would not have allowed the, the black codes and the Confederates to regain power so quickly as Andrew Johnson did. And that makes all the difference at a crucial window yeah. uh, where, where briefly the South knew it was defeated. And I think um, that that crucial backsliding in effect at a critical period had ramifications that, you know, have last, lasted a century. Yeah, it's an exceptional book. As we go out, uh, what what message do you maybe hope to send with the book or hope people get with the book or, or people are left with after reading the book? Well, I hope it's a book people love. I mean, you know, um, you know, uh, the, the texture and the characters uh, are, are always important to me. You know, I mean, when we read, we want to be transported someplace else. And I'm, I'm passionate about the idea of applied history, mm. that, that we learn history to apply it to our own times. Um, and the goal is useful wisdom. Um, uh, and, and that Lincoln's example, I think, retains the ability to inspire. I think also at a time when our, it's often said our nation feels more divided any time since the Civil War, when people are looking for historical examples that, that can unite us, that can provide a path away from violent polarization. I think Lincoln's leadership, Lincoln's wisdom, the idea of reconciliation as a virtue that we need to elevate. Um, rooted in, 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 in just kindness and common decency, um, but realizing you need to balance magnanimity with strength. Yeah. You know, Lincoln believed that pol decency could be the most practical form of politics, but people were going to be more likely to listen to reason when they were greeted from a position of strength. That, that's true, too. But his empathy, his honesty, his humor, his humility, those are our key qualities for us, I think, even and especially today. To, to depolarize and rediscover the better angels of our nature, which we desperately need to do now. If Abraham Lincoln could remember that there is more that unites us than divides us as Americans, even in the middle of civil war, certainly we can do at least that today. Definitely. That's definitely a message we need to take home. Thank you very much for being on the show. We really appreciate Thank it. Thank you so much, Chris. I appreciate it. Thank you. Give us your plugs one more time so people can uh, know where to look you up on the interwebs. Uh, at uh, Twitter, at John Avalon, same Instagram. You can find me on, on CNN doing my reality check every day. Um, website's johnavalon.com in addition to my work at CNN. But uh, just go buy the book, Lincoln, the Fight for Peace. Simon & Schuster, hot off the presses. Hot off the press. Lincoln and the Fight for Peace just came out February 15th, 2022 by John Avon. Guys, uh, go ahead and order the book wherever fine books are sold, but stay away from those alleyways. You might get uh, shipped in those alleyways. <laughs> Do wherever fine books are sold. Thanks to everyone for tuning in. Be good to each other. Stay safe, and we'll see you guys next time.